What's up guys? I'm going old school PowerPoint presentation today. Why? Because this is probably the simplest way that I can do this. Um, I think the old marker board technique is getting pretty outdated and I don't really want to uh, to do that anymore. I think it's going to be a lot easier for me and probably easier for you guys to understand if I do things um, like a slideshow. Okay, um, so today's video I'm going to be talking about supplements. Um, I'm an in-person uh, personal trainer. And one of the questions that I get a lot um, from clients of mine and just like just general gym rats or whatever is um, about supplements and what supplements as a trainer I recommend and what supplements I take, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I want to talk about that today because this is something that um, is pretty profound in the fitness industry is the, the supplement um, side of things. Um, pretty cheesy pictures. Um, I got Kai Green here with some muscle med shit and then just some pretty basic stuff at the bottom. Um, anyways, the topics that I want to discuss today is understanding supplements, um, briefly uh, reminding you some things about the supplement industry, and then we'll get into kind of like the meat and potatoes of the video, which is what are the supplements that I recommend, um, and then certain contexts that we should use with them. Anyways, moving on. So what is a supplement? Um, in, in the sense that I'm, I'm talking about in this video, I'm talking about nutritional supplements or dietary supplements, um, fitness industry specific. Anyways, a dietary supplement is a manufactured product intended to supplement the diet when taken by mouth as a pill, capsule, tablet, or liquid. This is really important to understand that within the word supplement itself, you are understanding what, what supplements are is they do not replace components of a good diet. They simply add to them or they fill the gaps that your diet may be missing. Now, it's really important to understand that supplements are not meant to um, replace certain things in your diet. Specifically, you should not be supplementing calcium when there is simply a place in your diet where you could add a calcium-rich food like Greek yogurt or something into your diet. This is obviously ignoring the possibility that the individual has a lactose intolerance. If you have a lactose intolerance and you physically cannot eat dairy, then you probably should supplement calcium to make up for what you're missing. Calcium is an extremely important mineral um, for the function of your body, um, but you shouldn't be taking calcium when you could simply eat Greek yogurt a couple times a week or something. Supplementing fish oil when you could simply be eating some wild-caught salmon two to three times a week. That's probably going to be cheaper in the long run than a lot of these omega-3 fish oil supplements. Um, some of these are pretty expensive. Um, some of them, they kind of taste like shit. They give you like a fishy after aftertaste. And when you burp throughout the rest of the day, you, uh, you're kind of tasting fish and shit. And that's, that's pretty nasty. Um, you could simply remedy this by just eating some some uh, wild caught salmon two to three times a week. Um, side note: I do prefer wild caught to to farm raised um, fish in general, but specifically salmon. I think getting some wild caught salmon is going to keep the integrity of the omega three um, fatty acids um, more more honest than if the fish was uh, farm raised. I think that there's potential with farm raised seafood that you're um, not only just overall protein quality, but EFA and omega-3 fatty acid quality kind of declines when you have fish that are eating an artificial diet. And the problem with these things is that you, t you take the risk with any supplement that you consume that um, what you're getting is actually less than what the label says and you're under consuming. So for example, uh, let's see, what's something I got here? All right, dim. I hope you guys can see this. This is now brands dim. Um, on the label, it says that for each capsule, I'm getting 200 milligrams of dim, 100 milligrams of calcium deglucurate, and 20 milligrams of sodium copper chlorophyll. So now, anytime I take this this supplement, and I, it's the label says that I'm taking in 200 milligrams of dim, there is a risk that I'm not actually getting 200 milligrams of dim. There is a risk that I'm getting 100 or 150. Um, it's pretty important to, to realize that with the exception of specific brands, um, 
these supplement companies can put whatever the hell they want on the label. Whether it's actually in there or not, we don't really know because nutritional supplements like these, your pre-workouts, your proteins, they're not regulated by the FDA. So there's not a third party that's actually going through the supplement and making sure that what the label says is in it is actually in it. So it's important that we understand that, that there is potential that we're under consuming if we're using supplements because these things aren't regulated by the FDA. Next, how important actually are supplements in the grand scheme of everything? Um, first of all, I want to say that this is not something that um, I came up with. This is a um, muscle and strength nutrition period that's been made famous by Dr. Eric Helms. He's a coach for 3DMJ or 3D Muscle Journey. Um, but I, I do want to use this picture because I think it puts into perspective um, how important supplements really are. So if you guys are familiar with the food pyramid, as we start, hopefully you guys can see my cursor here, at the bottom here is going to be the base of the pyramid, which is going to be what the most important thing is. And this is going to be, um, not for training, but but for nutrition, obviously. We've got energy balance, which is your, your calories in, calories out. We've got macronutrients, which will be your protein, carbs, and fats, what those calories are made of. Micronutrients, all your vitamins and minerals. Nutrient timing. And then at the top here, the smallest piece of the pyramid is going to be supplements. So by using um, a, a simple image like this, it's really important to understand that, that supplements are a pretty small piece of the puzzle. Now, are they completely meaningless? No, but nobody's going to have um, great results that are specifically based off of the supplements that they're, that they're taking. Again, the supplements that they're taking are simply to supplement everything that's going on down here. Their base diet, and then they we pretty much look at what gaps you're missing in that base diet, and then we supplement those things. Um, briefly talking about the supplement industry, it's really important that you understand and you know that the number one goal of the supplement industries is to make money. In order to do so, these supplement industries are getting really good at marketing the shit out of their products to make you, the consumer, feel that you need to buy the supplements. For example, um, let's see, Redcon One. Redcon One is a, a supplement and uh, supplement company that I I think is has good um, integrity. They've got some really good products. Um, but they've got a couple products that honestly, in my opinion, um, they're like natural anabolics. I think they're complete bullshit to be a hundred percent honest with you, but these, these supplement companies are going above and beyond to market the shit out of their products to make you as the consumer feel that this is something that you need to have, or you're missing, you're, you're missing out, right? There's gains that you could be had if you were to take these these natural anabolics or, or anything like that. Um, but you have to understand that that's marketing and that's what, what this company is trying to do so they can make more money than their overhead costs so that they can profit. Theoretically, it's, it's important to understand that there is no such thing as an essential or necessary supplement. Everything that we find in, in nutritional supplements, we can find through food. Now, realistically, this, this isn't, not only does this not happen, this isn't really possible. It's, it's not really possible for us to eat every single fruit, every single vegetable, every single meat, etc., etc., to get every single vitamin and mineral um, out of our diet. Now, this is specifically so when we're in a calorie-restricted diet, such as a fat loss phase, um, even more extreme, a contest prep if you're a, a competition bodybuilder. In that case, your food intake decreases, and it decreases over time. The less food that we eat, the less, how do I want to say this? The less food, the less food that we eat, the less chances there are that we're eating nutrient-rich foods in order to fulfill our, our body's needs. So in, especially in the case of a, of a calorically restricted diet, supplements become even more um, beneficial, in my opinion. So, supplement recommendations. Now, I've, I've got quite a few um, supplement recommendations. Some of these are going to be um, depending on your goal and depending on certain things. Um, but I do have some supplements that I, I recommend to everyone that is uh, regardless of your, of your goals. And then I'm going to give some context as to why I recommend the supplements and et cetera, et cetera. So getting into the supplements that I consider absolute musts, number one is going to be a multivitamin. 
This is the most basic supplement of all of them. It, it covers all of your bases from a, from a vitamin and mineral perspective. <sighs> Multivitamins, like I said previously, are going to be even more important in a calorie deficit because we're eating less food. Therefore, we're getting less nutrients from that food, so we need to supplement them. Multivitamins are extremely affordable. This is, uh, hopefully you guys can see this. Again, like when I, when I put something up to the webcam, I can't, I can't see if you can actually see it. This is a Walmart brand multivitamin, and I don't have the price tag or anything on this, but this is 100 tablets, and it probably cost me like five or six bucks. Like this shit's pretty cheap. Um, honestly, if you've got like the money, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get Walmart brand. I'm not really a fan of Walmart brand supplements um, in the first place. Um, but if you're just kind of the, the general everyday person who's, you know, lifting three to four times a week and, and everything like you, you can't go wrong with something like this. I think it's important that you check the serving size of your multivitamin. For example, um, I don't know if you guys can see this, the serving size for this particular one is, is one tablet. So it's a one a day. Um, but not all of the, the multivitamins that are on the market are, are one a day. So sometimes like you would have to take two or three tablets to get the, what, what the nutrition label says it is. And then I also tell people to make sure as you look at the ingredient, um, panel, if hopefully you guys can see this, you'll see the ingredient, how much is in it per serving, and then the percentage of your daily value. You want as many of these on the back to be a hundred percent or greater as possible. That's going to be the whole purpose of taking a multivitamin is getting a hundred percent of the recommended daily values of each vitamin and mineral. Um, so you're, you're covering all your bases. Next creatine. This is going to be obviously for the weightlifters. Um, creatine is extremely affordable. Not only is it extremely affordable, creatine is probably the number one most researched performance based supplement on the planet. If you go on PubMed and you search creatine, you are going to get pages and pages and pages of studies that that validate creatine as a legitimate um, performance increasing supplement. Now, I don't, I don't want to get too in depth on what creatine does because that's that's kind of a boring um, topic. But in in a nutshell, what creatine does when the body uses energy, it utilizes um, an energy source called ATP which is going to be adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine triphosphate is made up of an adenosine molecule and it's made up of three phosphate ions. So what happens while we're, while we're lifting weights is that we're using ATP. What happens is ATP loses one of its phosphate ions and it becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Again, the, the, the prefix triphosphate, we have three phosphate ions. Um, ADP is adenosine diphosphate, which means now we have two phosphate ions. So what happens is we kind of have the circle where we have ATP and then we lose a, a phosphate ion and it, ATP becomes ADP. Now what, what ADP needs is it needs another phosphate ion and so that it, it can become ATP again. And what happens when our muscles are saturated with creatine is our body produces um, an enzyme called uh, creatine kinase and it just so happens that creatine kinase is is very generous and it gives its phosphate ion to ADP very quickly and very efficiently so when ATP becomes ADP it can get the extra phosphate ion that it needs from creatine kinase extremely easily so what happens is it there's there's a cycle where ATP becomes ADP and then it comes back into ATP when our muscles are saturated with creatine, we can com complete the cycle faster, which effectively is going to help us get more reps in a set. For example, if we're doing a set of bench press and we're, our muscles aren't saturated with creatine, we may reach failure with five reps. But if our muscles are saturated with creatine, we may reach six reps because, excuse me, that ATP cycle has has resynthesized faster because our muscles have enough creatine where we can take the phosphate ion from creatine kinase. Anyways, that's that's a pretty dumbed down version of, of what creatine does. 
in order to get the benefits from creatine, we need to, to consume three to five grams daily of creatine. Um, creatine is, it takes a long time to saturate the muscles. Um, so for example, once we start taking creatine for the first time, it's going to take about two weeks or so of taking five grams a day in order for our muscles to become fully saturated. Um, but this is something that does need to be taken daily, every single day. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people fail with, with creatine is they don't consistently take it every day for weeks and months and years on end to, to be able to reap the benefits of it. There are lots of different kinds of creatine. Um, creatine monohydrate is going to be the, the one that we want to use. There's creatine hydrochloride. There's, there's a bunch of different kinds of creatine. It's, it's really important to understand that all the studies that validate creatine um, as a performance enhancer have been done on creatine monohydrate. It just so happens that creatine monohydrate is also the cheapest form of creatine. Um, so that's going to be the kind that you want to go with. There's also another type of creatine monohydrate out there that's called Creapure. Um, Creapure is Creapure is made from vegan fermented sources. Um, so it's it's in my opinion it's a cleaner form of creatine. Um, Creapure is also manufactured in Germany, whereas most of the the creatine forms like creatine monohydrate are manufactured in Japan. And I'm obviously not like an, uh, a master on exports, but Germany's reputation for exports, as in the, the materials that Germany exports to the United States, have a lot better reputation than the, the exports that Japan um, has exporting to the United States, just because Japan and China ship so much stuff to the United States that just naturally the quality of their exports tend to decrease. Um, I get my creatine of True Nutrition. For example, the creatine monohydrate on True Nutrition, 500 grams worth is like 13 bucks. So that's what, 100 days worth of creatine? The Creapure is like 16 bucks. So for an extra three bucks, I, I play it safe and I buy the Creapure. But again, if you're just a, a general everyday gym rat, just, just get the creatine monohydrate. You're probably not going to notice a difference. Um, timing for creatine is pretty irrelevant. Um, again, like how I said earlier, it takes about two weeks of taking it every day for it to, to saturate. So it takes a long time to get into your system. Um, I have a bro science theory. I don't actually have any real life science to back this up that if you were to take creatine with a simple carb source, like say Gatorade, when you consume a simple sugar like Gatorade or cyclic dextrin, dextrose, maltodextrin, etc., um, your insulin levels spike um, significantly higher. If you guys have watched my video on carbohydrates, you, we know that when insulin spikes, that essentially allows um, cells to open up and nutrients to be shuttled into the cell faster. So I have a bro science theory that if we take our creatine with a, a simple carbohydrate source, um, the increased insulin spike from the simple carbohydrate is going to allow more creatine to be shuttled into the cells and potentially shuttled faster. Again, that's just a complete bro science theory. So I take my um, creatine intra workout um, because I take in a simple carbohydrate source during my training session. Um, but for 99.9% .9 of the people, just take it whenever you can. If if you drink a cup of coffee every morning, just remember to put your creatine in it or something so you don't forget. You just have to be consistent and take the creatine every day. Next, vitamin C. Vitamin C is extremely affordable. It's probably the most potent antioxidant out there on the market. It fights heart disease, fights high blood pressure, amongst many other things. Um, it keeps us healthy, not sick. When we are sick, if we increase our vitamin C intake, there's some studies out there that show that we can um, become healthier faster. I recommend at a bare minimum you take 1,000 milligrams a day of, of vitamin C. I've got, let's see... Sorry, I'm, I got all my supplements here on like my desk by my bed. This is vitamin C, one gram, 1,000 milligrams. This is 100 servings, and I got this for eight bucks. Um, you can definitely get it cheaper online. You can probably get it even cheaper at Walmart. Again, I don't like to get my supplements from Walmart. Um, I like to use more reputable brands, but um, for most people, vitamin C is extremely affordable super, um, again, potent antioxidant. It's going to keep us healthy, fight inflammation. 
start at a gram. When we get sick, when, like when I get sick, I, I take up to three grams a day. Um, there's some research. I wouldn't say research. Some more like theories that if you're like a lifter on anabolic steroids, you may want to take more again to fight off heart disease and high blood pressure, etc. Um, but that's that's something that I may talk about later. Another absolute must is going to be omega-3 fish oils. I'm kind of contradicting myself here in, in the, like I said in one of the first couple slides, that there's no reason really to take an omega-3 supplement if we can consume wild-caught salmon two to three times a week. And within within the remedy is also the, the issue. A lot of people aren't going to and don't want to eat wild-caught salmon two to three times a week. If that's you, then I would take an omega-3 um, supplement. There's a lot of benefits to omega-3 oils, and I don't, I don't really want to get into them too much. Um, just right off the, the top, brain health, depression, it's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, reduces the risk of heart disease, uh, increases joint lubrication, etc., etc., etc. Omega-3 is pretty affordable. It's, it's not very expensive. It is important to understand that what we're looking for in an omega-3 supplement is going to be anywhere from 500 to 2,000 milligrams of combined EPA and DHA um, per serving. Again, I hope you guys can see this. Oh, never mind. Don't listen to me. If you look at the back of any omega-3 fish oil supplement, it's going to tell you, say, serving size is two capsules, and then it'll say... This is just, these are just arbitrary numbers. EPA, 400 milligrams. DHA, 200 milligrams. We add those two together. That's obviously 600 milligrams. Um, we're looking for anywhere between 500 to 2,000 milligrams per serving. Up on the higher end, if you're an enhanced bodybuilder or power lifter taking anabolic steroids, again, for heart disease and, and joint health and anti-inflammatories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for most people taking anywhere from 500 to 1,000 milligrams of combined EPA, DHA is going to be pretty beneficial for you. Um, if we look at the the research, krill oil is going to be um, more beneficial than just regular omega-3 fish oils. Um, catch-22 with that is that krill oil is a little bit more expensive. Um, so, for example, a month, a month supply of fish oil costs me like 10, 15 bucks. A month's worth of krill oil cost me like 30 bucks. So it's it's quite a bit more, um, but it is much more beneficial to you. So just keep that in mind. Next, another absolute must is going to be vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is pretty dose dependent. Um, vitamin D3 is synthesized in the skin from your sun exposure. Um, your vitamin D levels can be tested on a, a blood test. And if you do decide to get your, your vitamin D tested on a blood test, the natural range that you're looking for is somewhere between 30 to 100. Vitamin D improves the absorption of calcium, magnesium, iron, and more. Um, and the main thing with vitamin D is it's not something that's really found in a lot of foods. So it is something that, in my opinion, should be supplemented. Um, vitamin D is not sold. Contradiction. I'm using a Walmart brand here for vitamin D because I've had this forever. Um, one of these soft gels is 5,000 IUs, which is going to be kind of the, the upper range dose. Like how, how I said, vitamin D is dose dependent. If you get a lot of sun and you're pretty tan, like you can probably get away with 1,000 to 2,000 IUs. If you're extremely pale like me, like I'm like mayonnaise pale, man. Like I am blindingly pasty. 5,000 IUs is the type of shit that I need. I need some real heavy duty vitamin D. Otherwise I would just be under consuming. So now, these are some supplements that are not necessarily absolute musts, but I do recommend that you take them. Um, depending on your lifestyle and dietary choices, they may become necessary. Um, there will be some things that we need to test in, in blood work, etc., um, and just general diet practices. But these are things that I recommend, but they're not necessarily absolute musts. Whey protein. Um, whey protein is pretty affordable. Um, the main thing with, with whey protein is that it's extremely convenient. If you're someone who's very, very busy um, and you can't eat whole meals with chicken, steak, eggs, etc. To, to reach your protein requirements for the day, 
then this is where whey protein really shines because you can just wake up in the morning, make a shake, and drink it. If you're at work, you can just make a shake and drink it in 30 seconds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so whey protein proves very beneficial for those that are very busy. Um, as far as how much to take, I just say consume it as necessary to reach daily target protein intake. Um, I recommend that most people, if you can reach your protein intake without whey protein, go for it. I think you're going to get a lot more um, zoo nutrients and just general vitamins and minerals from uh, whole food like chicken, beef, steak, eggs, turkey, whatever, um, fish, than you would from whey protein. Um, but whey protein is also extremely bioavailable, so it's, uh, it's, not, it's not something that's bad that should be shunned upon. Um, I would stay away from Walmart brands. I would get a trusted brand like Dimatize Nutrition, um, True Nutrition. These proteins are actually third-party tested to make sure that they, uh, what's in them is actually what the, the label says is in them. And then I would recommend for most people to get a whey isolate. Most protein is going to be sold in two forms, whey concentrate and whey isolate. Excuse me. Whey concentrate is going to be cheaper, um, but it's got a lot more fat, sugar, carbs in it than, than isolate does. Isolates are filtered more. They remove the, the carbs and sugar and fats, and it also removes a bit of the lactose. So if you are lactose intolerant, um, side note, whey protein is dairy. Whey is a byproduct of cheese. Um, cheese is obviously a dairy product, contains milk. So if, if, if you're lactose intolerant and you can't take whey protein, um, there are some like vegan options that you could use, but I, I would try whey protein isolate first. And if, if you still can't digest whey protein isolate, then I would move on to something like a vegan source. Um, conditionally recommended again is going to be a fruit and greens powder. You can get these at, at Walmart pretty cheap. Um, I I think the the Walmart fruit and greens are, are pretty good. I think in, in a situation with a fruit and greens powder, something is better than nothing. Um, they become arguably more important in an extended caloric surplus um, because what happens when you're in a caloric surplus, for example, when I was at the peak of my past off-season, I was eating about 4,800 calories a day, and on leg and back days, I was eating close to 5,000 calories a day. When I'm eating that much food a day, I don't eat vegetables because vegetables, one, don't contain hardly any calories at all, and two, when I'm eating 5,000 calories a day, I'm not hungry. I don't want to add more food to make myself even more full, which will make all my subsequent meals harder to eat. So in that case, when I'm not eating vegetables, a fruit and greens powder becomes more important. Um, and, and a situation like that, I would do two servings a day, one in the morning, one at night. Um, if I'm eating vegetables with half of my meals or more, I would just do one serving whenever it's convenient. Um, but again, this is something that isn't really necessary, but, uh, conditionally it's, it's something that I would highly recommend. So then I have some supplements that I recommend based on your dietary choices. For example, if you follow a, a gluten-free diet, um, just because of the nature of the foods you're eating in a gluten-free diet, diet, you're going to find yourself deficient in magnesium, calcium, vitamin D, B vitamins, etc., etc. So in that case, I would supplement those. If you're in a contest prep diet or just any very aggressive, calorically restricted diet, I would recommend that you supplement iron. Um, simply because you're probably not eating red meat in that situation, and red meat is an excellent source of iron. Um, and also I would supplement iodine. Iodine is a, a nutrient that's going to keep your thyroid, um, which is a, a gland in your throat. It's going to keep your, um, your thyroid, uh, filled with iodine for lack of a better word. And it's going to keep your thyroid, um, and therefore your metabolism, um, moving optimally when you're in a, a period where you're not e eating a lot of food. If you follow a vegan diet, because again, because of the foods that you're you're not eating, you're missing out on some iron, some zinc, and some vitamin K2. Um, in those kind of situations, I would supplement those. Enhanced athletes. This is a touchy subject, um, but it's important to understand that I'm involved in the bodybuilding and powerlifting industry, um, or scene, or whatever, and these things. 
um, exogenous hormones and, and things like that are pretty prominent. Um, and I, I think my duty as a coach is not to necessarily um, shy away from those things, but if athletes are going to use them, I think it's important for not just myself, any coach in general, to um, to make sure that your athlete is is going to do partake in this activity in the healthiest way possible. So if you're an enhanced athlete taking exogenous testosterone, trenbolone, whatever, um, you, the the need for supplementing health supplements is going to increase, and it's probably going to increase significantly, specifically with higher doses. So what we're really focusing on when we look at supplements um, in this type of realm, in this type of scene, is when we supplement exogenous hormones like testosterone, um, we inevitably are going to get some side effects, um, obviously negative side effects. So the, the goal of supplementing here is to prevent, um, and if we can't necessarily prevent, then we can control um, how bad these these side effects are uh, or can be. And there's a lot of supplements that we can use. Um, for example, I think the best way to, to go about this is to look at um, the drug that you're using, first of all. There are different kinds of drugs, um, both oil-based, which we inject, and then we have oral drugs, which we take um, by tablet, by mouth. Um, these are synthesized differently. Um, which therefore are going to have us experiencing some different side effects depending on what drug we're taking. Um, it's also going to depend on our blood work. If you're an enhanced athlete and you're not, um, I'm, I don't want to rant about this, but if you're an enhanced athlete and you're not getting your blood work taken three to four times a year, um, one, you're, you're stupid. Um, you're being extremely reckless and careless with your body. But what's really important with taking the blood work is we can see the trends. So for example, if we increase the amount of testosterone that we're taking and our liver enzymes rise, we can we can therefore put like a correlation with the more testosterone I take, the higher my liver enzymes get. So the more that the more testosterone I take, the more NAC, TUDCA, glutathione, etc. that I need to take to potentially combat and bring those those liver enzymes down. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over some of the, the general um, side effects of, of anabolic steroid use and then some of the supplements that we can use to uh, to fight off and combat the, the negative side effects. Again, I'm not going to get too much into dosages because that's going to depend on your blood work uh, more often than not but these are just some some general um, supplements that we can use liver function our liver enzymes tend to rise when we take anabolic steroids specifically oral anabolic steroids because they're synthesized in the liver um, so in order to combat that we can use things like nac tudka glutathione i didn't put um milk thistle on here but that's that's also something that we can take um, those are four supplements that are highly recommended if you're going to take anabolic steroids. What happens when we take anabolic steroids is our muscles grow in size, obviously. Um, but I think a lot of people forget that your heart is also a muscle. The issue with your heart growing is, for example, when our bicep grows from anabolic steroid use, hypothetically, there's unlimited room for our bicep to to grow outwards. There, there's a problem with, with the heart is when we take anabolic steroids, our heart grows, but our heart can only get so big because we've got ribs and, and bones and shit that are in the way. So it, it, it can't, it can only grow outward and get bigger um, so much. Once it reaches that maximum point, the heart is actually going to kind of grow inwards on itself and it's going to become thicker. When the heart becomes thicker and heavier, it has to work harder, has to pump more blood, and uh, what what generally happens with that, and most of the deaths related to anabolic steroid use are cardiac related. They they have a heart attack or something. Um, so it's very important that we supplement, um, as well as doing cardio and shit like that to to keep our our heart uh, pumping effectively. It, it's important to uh, to take some. Some over-the-counter supplements. Specifically, I like to use baby aspirin. 
Um, Ubiquin all CoQ10. I don't like to use regular CoQ10. I think that the the Ubiquin all version is going to be better um, in this particular case. Um, Cardatone is a, a supplement. Um, MPA supplements makes a they make a supplement called Cardisolve. I think the main ingredient in that in that supplement is Ubiquin all CoQ10. Um, but there's there's a host of other supplements and in, or ingredients in that supplement that are aimed at keeping our heart healthy. Um, I recommend that we take vitamin K2. Um, vitamin K2 is going to decrease and potentially reverse plaque buildup. Um, in that same sort of category, citrus bergamot. Citrus bergamot is going to keep our cholesterol slash lipid profile healthy. Um, when we take anabolic steroids, it tends to increase our um, bad cholesterol and decrease our good cholesterol, which is kind of a recipe for, for plaque buildup in our arteries, which again can lead to a heart attack. Um, this is obviously enhanced the more that you take and the more cholesterol is a genetic trait in your family. For example, in my family, we have a, a genetic trait of high cholesterol. Um, so these are things that, that I obviously pay attention to, but dependent on you as the individual, this is going to matter more to you. Um, astragalus. Astragalus is probably the only supplement on the planet um, that has scientific proven evidence that it reduces kidney scarring and will help improve our kidney function. Um, there's a lot of ways in which anabolic steroids tend to mess with our kidneys. Um, I have a bro science theory that obviously the more anabolic steroids you take, the more nitrogen synthesis and, and protein we can synthesize in the body. Um, therefore, we can increase our dietary protein intake, which may potentially um, damage our, our kidneys in the long term. So by using astragalus, uh, we can kind of reverse that uh, effect. Um, curcumin. One of the big things that we really want to do when we take in uh, anabolic steroids is reduce the, the inflammation that we have within the body. Um, and curcumin is probably the most powerful anti-inflammatory. It's got a lot of scientific studies on it that it's significantly better um, than shit like ibuprofen, whatever, um, for, for fighting inflammation. Um, curcumin, I specifically recommend the, oh, what's the name of the brand? I can't think of the brand right now. I'll, I'll put a link in the description when I find it. Um, curcumin is something that I would probably recommend whether you're natural or enhanced, um, especially if you're a, uh, a pretty, like, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Especially if you're like pretty into bodybuilding and weightlifting in general. And in general, your joints and just your body is going to have a lot of inflammation in it. So um, I, I recommend curcumin. Whether you're natural or enhanced, but if you're enhanced, we're going to want to take more. Um, extra edge supplements now. These supplements are I, by no means necessary, and they're not really conditionally necessary in, in any sort of way. Um, these supplements are strictly for people who are kind of looking for the extra edge in their performance, recovery, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. This is going to be more for the athletes that are being competitive, whether you're a bodybuilder or um, powerlifter and you're looking to compete and you're trying to do everything that you can uh, to get the extra edge. So these supplements include intra-workout supplements um, such as amino acid products, carbohydrate products. Um, I kind of want to make a video at some point just in general about intra-workout nutrition. It's something that I believe in. Um, but just for the sake of this video, pretty much looking at amino acid products and carbohydrate products. Pre-workouts, we've got stimulant based and we've got non-stimulant based. The non-stimulant based pre-workouts are going to be engineered for um, blood flow and nitrous oxide production. And then the stimulant based ones are going to obviously provide a stimulant feel, which is going to energize us and, and fight fatigue and et cetera, et cetera. Glucose disposal agents, um, in my opinion, these become very beneficial once you get above, say, 600 grams of carbs a day. Um, obviously, there's ways that we can test this. We can test our blood glucose levels and administer GDAs based off of that. Um, next, we have cortisol slash stress adaptogens. 
These are going to be things like ashwagandha, rhodiola rosa, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what these supplements do is they decrease cortisol, which is our body's um, stress hormone. So it, it can help turn on our, our PNS and uh, help us calm down specifically before bed and after an intense training session. We've got hormone optimization supplements um, like zinc. Zinc is a natural testosterone booster if you're deficient in zinc, and it's also kind of a natural estrogen blocker. DIM, DIM is a supplement that I showed earlier. DIM works to, it's essentially an estrogen filter. So similar to our cholesterol, where we have good cholesterol, we have bad cholesterol. When we look at estrogen, we have good estrogen and we have bad estrogen. Um, for our good estrogen is going to be what we call 2-hydroestrone, and our bad estrogen is what we call 4-hydroestrone. And by taking DIM, we can essentially um, cause the bad estrogen, the 4-hydroestrone, to more easily be binded up so that it can be excreted. It, it, in, in layman's terms, taking DIM is an estrogen filter. It helps us filter out the bad estrogen. Um, DIM is something that's uh, beneficial, in my opinion, if you're a natural lifter or bodybuilder, um, but it can also be beneficial if you are an enhanced athlete who is not currently using an, an aromatase inhibitor. So if you're on testosterone and you're not taking, you know, letrozole, tamoxifen, arimidex, aromacin, whatever, we may want to take some, some DIM uh, to help filter out some of our bad estrogens. And then we've got sleep aids. Sleep aids work good with the cortisol slash stress adaptogens. Um, specifically with the sleep aids, we're looking at things like melatonin, um, some GABA mixes to help increase our body's serotonin levels. Um, amongst many things, obviously the sleep aids main goal is to help us fall asleep and improve the quality of the sleep. Um, excuse me, I'm sure you guys are aware that we don't actually build muscle while we're lifting. We build it in the recovery phase. And sleep is an extremely important part of that recovery phase. So it's really important that we, uh, that we maximize rest and sleep. So to conclude everything that was just made in the video, while hypothetically there are no necessary supplements, there are certain supplements that are extremely valuable um, to the vast majority of us um, because the reality is, is that we can't reach all of our vitamin, mineral, et cetera, et cetera, um, needs through food, it's, it's very unlikely. Supplements are meant to supplement your diet, not replace key components. Um, so for example, if if eating, like just I'm using the example of the fish oil and the salmon, if you can eat um, wild caught salmon two to three times a week, you like salmon, you can afford it, etc., then do that and don't take fish oil. Um, but if it's something where it doesn't really meet your needs, you don't like salmon, you can't afford it, whatever, whatever, then take the omega-3 fish oils. Um, but if there's something where you can put something in your diet that is going to get rid of the need to take a supplement, then that's something that you should be doing. Um, there are supplements that are not necessary, but they, they do prove to be beneficial. And whether or not you should invest in these is going to kind of be a price of value type thing. If if it's worth the money to you, then, then go for it. And more often than not, especially if you're getting the supplement from a reputable brand, it, it's going to be worth it. If, it. if it's financially worth it to you, then go for it. Um, but just make sure that you do your research before you buy it um, and you don't throw your money away because the supplement industry is pretty good at making people throw their money away on useless shit. Anyways, hope you guys liked it. If you like it, subscribe. Thumbs up video. Uh, yeah, have a good one. Thanks for watching.